Hi, I'm Bill Elliott, the artist of this painting, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about it. It will be in the Henning Cultural Center Works of Men show, which begins in early August 2014. This is a very complex painting, and it took me about an, a year to do it. It's in oils, and what I've done, as you can see, I've divided the picture up into what is effectively six separate pictures. However, I'd like to point out that everything interacts in a very dynamic manner, and because the dynamism is all going on concurrently, it's uh, somewhat difficult to go to a specific spot in the picture and describe what's going on when you're not looking at the picture in its entirety. But we'll give it a shot and uh, let's start out with uh, kind of an overview of what you see. You will see some spears. They divide the picture into two large portions. One to the left consists of two of the cubes, the one to the right four cubes, and the representation of these spears and the areas they enclose uh, is that uh, those on the left represent the rest of the world other than the United States and the area enclosed on the right represents the United States. You will note that the spear points are somewhat confrontational where they interact. Again, you will see uh, another plane of activity, which is a stealth bomber, and it's in confrontation with a cobra. Now I'm going to go in close to the picture on the upper left, and if you look at the back plane, I've used this back plane to represent ancient history. And what we see in this back plane is an obelisk on the left, to lower left. To the right of that, we see a raptor, which is a falcon, which is Horus, the Egyptian god of kings. Now, still looking at back planes, as we move to the right, we see a, another obelisk, uh, but it is not going into the back plane. What we have in a back plane is a tunnel, and we have at the uh, entrance to that tunnel, we have a Statue of Liberty, and she's holding a light up. Uh, we may speculate, is uh, she showing the light at the end of the tunnel, or is she showing the way? Moving again to the right, we take a look at the back plane and we see the beak of a raptor and lo and behold it appears that it may be our own beloved American Eagle, the bald eagle. The notation to be made here is that we're looking at thousands of years of difference in time, but as a human race, we're still using the same symbols. I'm going to shift back across the picture again, and then I will drop down right below the upper left cube to the one under it. And again, we see temples. Of course, the Egyptians were known for their pyramids. We have pyramids again. These are the Mesoamerican pyramids of the Mayans and Aztecs. And, uh, a sacrificial knife, which lo and behold, again, it's the bird Quetzalcoatl. As we move to the right into the area of spears that is uh, enclosed that represents the United States, I'm going to, uh, we'll move back for orientation of these four squares. Okay, now, if you will look at the square, the upper left, you will see a necktie. That area represents the halves. The area directly below that represents the have-nots in society. 
I will then move to the right of the squares that represents the halves and what we have is a representation of the federal power and the exercise of the federal power in the society and as we move down below that we have what is portrayed as the bureaucracies that are hinged on this federal bureaucracy and that includes not just federal bureaucracies but the state bureaucracies as well as well that administer many of the federal programs so let's take a look at some of the interactions that we have going on Now we look forward of the bike plane and we have basically what can be thought of as the present. And we see two ships which are going communicating, uh, of course, across these uh, borders, oceans, whatever, into the United States. And these are representing mass merchandising the interdependence of oil, the economic activity, the necktie, uh, the mark of the upper class, the, the upper middle class, the moneyed class, the business class. As we look, follow the arm that runs through the area between these two cubes, we see that the arm with the pinstripe shirt is dropping money into the cubicle of the federal bureaucracy. Now, as we follow the descent of this money, it falls through what should be a blue field of stars and an American flag, but that blue field is gone and ha has come to rest down below in the cube. Uh, but we also take note that there are no more stars in this field. Something has happened. Perhaps these 50 windows represent what used to be those stars and are now nothing but bureaucracy. Perhaps the two doors at the bottom of these this 50 windows, uh, perhaps they represent political parties. We note the preponderance of green in the building of bureaucracy and as we approach the top it suspiciously starts the windows start to take on the same markings as the battle ribbons or the ribbons from the various large conflicts that the United States has participated in. If we look at this volume of conflicts uh, we can, down at the bottom right, we can see the slight red trickle of blood that feeds into the red of the American flag and becomes a part of that. These ribbons, liberty at the bottom, that is the representative of the Revolutionary War, Purple Heart, uh, there was nothing for the Battle of 1812 that was a ribbon, and the Purple Heart somewhat represent that, that in the Revolutionary War. Above that, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, the Korean conflict, Vietnamese conflict, Iraq I, Iraq II, Afghanistan, and we see there is not a whole lot more room for more conflicts in this day and age. It's very interesting. Now again, the star at the center of these four squares that represent America is the center of power, the ultimate power, where the decision making is made. And as we move to the right of that into the cube, 
that represents federal power. We see that decisions that affect the future are being made and perhaps these decisions are a yellow brick road that leads to ultimately a darkening sky such as those failed societies uh, like the Mesoamerican society and the Egyptian society uh, have in their fields. And of course we see liberty uh, has somehow ended up uh, hung up on the wall, uh, perhaps taking a rest for a while, perhaps a permanent, who knows. And then uh, we see that an airplane has, uh, uh, we'll say, either intruded or been invited into this airspace. And uh, it, it has an interesting red star on it, which uh, of course could possibly be symbolic of something. So let us move around the picture to see if we can find where it comes from. And ah yes, the magic of closure has led us to see that it comes from the area that uh, also the Forbidden City, the Oriental Forbidden City came from. So we've made that observation and uh, that gives us something to ponder. Uh, we can move down. Uh, oh, let's go to, uh, to the plane that hovers above the picture. And it looks very much like a thermometer and a thermometer being heated. This, uh, is this political heating up? Is this global warming? Uh, who knows? And I see also we have uh, something that is suspiciously uh, looking like uh, either a rock or maybe even a burka that the uh, cobra is coiling its tail protectively around as it confronts the technology of the very powerful stealth bomber which can cast its shadow anywhere in the world. And although it is not the latest technology, it is a very powerful technology. If we move to the right, we can see the forces of economics at work. We see the mass merchandiser with its container moving into the society of the haves as we do, as we see the oil tanker. Uh, both of these ships with their anchors are well anchored in the society. And uh, the uh, necktie, of course, represents uh, those with somewhat more prestige than the have-nots. And as we move down from the cubicle of the haves and into the area of the have-nots, uh, we see that the haves have a fence around them and it's a protective fence and uh, although it has facility for a gate uh, that's just a facade because it has no hinges and has no way to open. We see a gun, a hand with uh, holding, brandishing a gun and the effectiveness of this is much as a theater prop that the gun issues a flag that says bang. Basically ineffective. As we move down into the cubicle that represents the have-nots, we have a crib. And this looks like just a breeding ground of more have-nots. Uh, and because they are merely the ones that will populate this infinite prison. As we look to the right, we see a pair of dice with craps. And of course, craps means you lose. And we see lottery tickets issuing forth. And every lottery ticket is a loser. We move up, we see an arm 
that reaches out of the have-nots area and into the federal and state bureaucracy cubes where it grabs onto a rope that activates mechanisms that feed money to the have-nots. But if we look at the how this works for the have-nots, at the same time it's bringing them bits of wealth, it's strangling them, it's choking them. So, in fact, there is no help. There is merely an endless futility. Now, if we look at how the bureaucracy is managing the lottery, uh, we see here that it is merely uh, looks like uh, lottery tickets or but uh, rolls of uh, tissue you would find in a bathroom and uh, a golden fleece. Uh, so perhaps we are but fleecing the people that we are supposed to help. And then, of course, there's the information gathering aspect of bureaucracy with the endling, endless filing cabinets of information that go into infinity. Now, there is a very peculiar aspect of this picture and I'm sure the viewer has noticed this golden thread that meanders through every aspect of this painting. It ties everything together and so we are led to wonder what is this? What is this thread? This force? this meandering, odd, binding force that makes all of this work. And of course it ends up in this Gordian knot that we can never decipher. We'll note from the artist, when I do a painting, I am but a passenger. I become the slave to the painting and the slave to the ideas and it directs me what to paint. It's most interesting because I no more have control over what ends up in a painting than the man in the moon. What I start out to paint rarely ends up in the final painting. And I thank you for your time and I hope you have time to see the original at the Henning Cultural Center, the Works of Men show, and I will be there when they have their reception uh, and uh, be more than happy to talk to anyone about this painting. And thank you very much.